The year was 1930. Radio was king, television merely a crazy idea. There was no Highway 100 or 94, but there was a depression, the Great Depression. And there were bread lines and a drought, and generally things were pretty bleak across the country. It wasn't exactly the best time to start a lumber company. The real American people are digging themselves out of this depression with industry and with courage. And uh, so Munn came home with this idea of the 250 of buying this uh, sawmill. You know, to them it was sort of an adventure. Here you've got this big steam engine rig and you got the saw and you got the logs that are being dragged out of the river and basically they're free and I don't know if they saw it as easy money, but they saw it as an opportunity. So uh, uh, he went down and uh, Dad cut the deal for $240. So just a little bit, got $240 for it. A few months later, they, they bought the other half interest by giving their partner the lumber they had sawed up. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, log jams several miles long were common. The weight drove thousands of logs into the soft river bottom, where they waited to be pulled up with hook and chain by enterprising men like Clarence and Munshare. They'd get up in the morning at about 5 o'clock to start the fire in the boiler and go get some logs and work until dark. And then they'd go to bed. Dad slept right down there with a couple guys. And of course, there was no electricity. They were using uh, steam-powered vehicles or machinery. Uh, and of course, these fellows went to grade school and they, they, they had to figure out how to run a steam engine so they could run these, uh, these uh, low-pressure boilers to run their sawmill. And they had belts and pulleys and blades and stuff flying around it. I, I didn't see it. I saw pictures of it. It looked like a mess. It was extremely hard work, and it was dangerous, especially considering the fact that neither Clarence or Munn were all that comfortable with the water. And I know that Munn could never sweat. He wasn't necessarily afraid of the water as long as he could touch the bottom. <laughs> you can imagine what our safety director, Wayne Niles, would have said to them if he were there. Munn, Clarence, what are you thinking? You're on the river, you're using poles and chains, you got no gloves, you got no glasses, you got no hard helmets. Clarence, you don't even have a life jacket on, you can't swim, and Mun, steel toes, you're not even wearing shoes. Why do I try? In the winter, logging was, well, impossible. So the two enterprising brothers did the next best thing. They made ice. Had it not been for Clarence's wife, however, we might all be working for Shear Brothers Ice Company. My uh, mother uh, saved her kitchen money and uh, put a down payment on a refrigerator on a lay-by. And uh, Dad really got upset with that because he said, "We look at I sell ice. You can't you can't go out and buy a refrigerator that's putting me out of business. How was that? How did that look?" He came home and they, they they had a they had a moment. I want a refrigerator. <laughs> Mom was about a, a Frigidaire, and uh, he just couldn't quite get over that. And uh, he figured out quick enough that the wave of the future was not in the ice business, so he, he exited that. In the 10 years that followed, the early crew at Shear Brothers sawed up between 10 and 15 million board feet of lumber and stacked it all by hand. But they, they, it was a dry pile sort of system, so it was packed loose. It was they piled it loose, and they they use a, a, a row of uh, boards across, and then cross strips, and then another row of boards, so that the air could get through and dry this this soaking wet lumber. And of course, there were no lift trucks. You had to hand everything up and take everything down, you know, one piece at a time. He always said that they didn't hire an accountant for the first five to 10 years, and he was grateful they didn't because they would have found out that they were broke and they would have quit working. So they didn't know they were broke, so they just stayed at it, is the way he put it. They just stayed at it. And uh, Dad says, talked, conferred with Mun and said, we got to raise our prices. And they said, well, we're not selling anything anyway, but it's, it doesn't make any difference. If we don't raise our prices, we're going to be broke either way. It doesn't make it. And at that time, Charlie, a guy by the name of Charlie Gerster, he came down to the yard and he was looking for some lumber. 
uh, for, to build the uh, forming for the First National Bank building in, in downtown St. Paul. And when he came, he came down there right at that point and bought everything they had to put into that basement. And that was the uh, watershed moment. In the 1930s, lumber was cheap, and I do mean cheap. Our first office was built on the site of the current Minneapolis yard. Back then, a cup of coffee was a nickel, and a gallon of gas, get this, was a dime. And the average home cost less than $5,000. Our phone number was shorter and easier to remember, and there were six employees at Shear Brothers. By the 1940s, Shear Brothers' lumber business had grown. Our customer base was nearing 100 builders or so, and we had a little more than 20 full-time employees. Brighter smile for me and you. You'll wonder where the yellow went when you brush your teeth with Pepsi. That great Christmas classic, It's a Wonderful Life, hit the movie theaters, and Munn enlisted and served in World War II. At home, there were war restrictions and rationing on everything from gasoline, three to five gallons a week, to quotas on building materials. That made it difficult to keep our promises to our customers, but not impossible. We had to get, mm, creative. I know Dad used to uh, fly out to the West Coast and, and uh, uh, have uh, nylon stockings, which were hard to get, and, and uh, whiskey. He would come home and the uh, carloads of lumber would come and after that. Lumber was very hard to get and the larger builders would come to them and said, I'll give you a guaranteed price if you guarantee me all your product. And Munn and Clarence said, no. We got these many customers. Every one of our customers gets an allotment. Everybody stays busy. And uh, that made friendships for them that lasted for years and years and years. Back in those days, and, and Hardware stores used to sell groceries, a lot of things back then. They were more like general merchandise stores. And a customer came in and they wanted some butter and, and she didn't know what the price of the butter was, so she yelled and to the, the owner and back you know, asked how much butter was. And his response was, who is it? Well, for Share Brothers, it didn't matter who it was as far as how we treated them or what they paid. Getting lumber was one thing, delivering it was quite another. The first Shear Brothers truck drivers had to contend with the hated and temperamental D-Series International flatbed trucks. It was a four-speed truck, and at least two of the speeds would work once in a while. And the steering reminded me of the Titanic when they were approaching the iceberg. You saw him turn the wheel over about six times before the boat reacted. During the war years, our drivers had to deal with some pretty tough restrictions, like a speed limit of 35 miles per hour. But we had a secret weapon. Good old Kamikaze Harry. Okay, that's not Harry. That's better. And because of gas rationing and this type of thing, you weren't supposed to be out on the road at certain hours of the day, so he would actually go out and deliver at night to get around the the gas rationing thing and to enable him to do that not get detected he'd have to drive with his lights off so it came known it's kamikaze harry or moonlight harry because they drive by the moonlight today we have more than 100 delivery vehicles to keep running wonder what our mechanics would do with one of our first trucks where's the engine what is this? A trumpet? Where the heck am I supposed to plug this in? Sometime in the mid to late 40s, our customers came to us and asked if there wasn't some way to get windows in less time and for less money. The first windows we made were actually double hung windows, which was the window that was around, and we would send out uh, four pieces of frame, two pieces of weather stripping, and two sash in a bundle, and they would actually build the window on the job site. Share Brothers has been blessed with a host of highly ethical and very successful customers, many of whom have been with us since the beginning of the building boom in the 40s and 50s. In uh, August of 46, and that was my first two houses. In those days, uh, it was um, hand stick. Hand, cut your rafters by hand. 
eight penny nails, one at a time, the whole side of the hollow. Roof boards, eight inch roof boards, same thing. Oh. You can just imagine how impossible it would be to try and conduct business today with the tools of that era. What the? Oh. Where is IT? They, they were always trying innovations to make the job easier. The whole bunch of them down there were people you could trust and you'd walk in and they'd always have a hello for you and you felt just like part of the family. And we had a lot of customers like that who were very upfront if you didn't do it right, but extremely loyal in spite of or because of that, because they knew that you'd take care of it. And they knew that they could come up and, and be honest with you and no one would ever suggest they were a top customer. They're very small, little Northeast remodelers, but we had hundreds of these guys, and they became the backbone of the company. I remember one guy was uh, Les uh, Hewitt. His famous expression was, well, I hope to kiss a pig. He said that to everybody when he met him. It kind of impressed me. In the late 1950s, Roger Scher joined his father Clarence in the business, and the expansion of Scher Brothers truly began as the building market continued to grow. Roger and, and Gary and Mike and Greg, when they came into the business, that was a big change. The history of this thing, though, is built on, on uh, the needs of the customer uh, and, and the, the, the desire of the customer to do it better and faster and to multiply his efforts. When I think back of those days when we had to hang those doors by hand, oh. And we brought in the shop where we could make eight doors per man per day, and now I don't know how, but if they make 50 probably or 100. Then they came out after that and they had a truck where the whole bed would go up maybe eight, 10 feet. We did have one of the first lift trucks so then in the 40s. And they were always doing things like that. It was the early 1960s, and there was social unrest across the country. President Kennedy and Martin Luther King are assassinated. The Beatles tour America, and in 1965 there is a winter and a spring to remember and endure in Minnesota. The flood of 65 threatened every stick of inventory at Shear Brothers, including a fledgling window production plant, as seen here. Towns are getting flooded out, and the engineer said, your main office is going to be four feet underwater. If they hadn't been farmers, if they had been country boys, if they had been pure business college men, they would have evacuated what they could and then started looking up the full number of their insurance company. I had flood watch. I was there at like two o'clock in the morning watching the water rise on the Mississippi and it never got high enough to give the alarm. Uh, Munn had conceived the idea of building a dike out of uh, units of lumber and using polyethylene as a barrier. Engineers and things, different people came and looked at it and told them it wouldn't hold and they were quite proud of the fact that it did hold and they put up a big sign that said we're still dry. They were quite quite pleased that in their, their, their simple way with their eighth grade education they were able to figure out how to hold back the flood water when everybody else was telling them this wouldn't work. By the late 1970s, we all knew what a Jedi was, and most of our building customers wished they could have hired one to get their hands on trusses in less than 10 weeks. Once again, here was a chance to be more responsive. The decision was made to start truss manufacturing and begin making and selling trusses directly to our customers. Well, you, you couldn't tell. You know, you order trusses, you'd, you'd wait around until they came. You know, you'd have no idea. They'd be eight weeks out or something like that. I think that was a smart thing to do is to go in the trust business because it ties in with everything else. You know. I don't think they really knew exactly how big it could get, but um, we're one of the biggest trust plants in the United States, actually. But as far as sales go, most trust plants are three to four million, five million dollars, and last year we were at 18. By the 1980s, Share Brothers had nearly 400 employees and broke the 50 million dollar mark in sales. 
and celebrated our 50th year in business. Building continued to grow and the future seemed extremely bright. Until one night in 1985, when one of our customers who lived across the river from the Minneapolis yard got up to get a drink of water and noticed his lumber yard was on fire. He called it in, but it was too late to save door eight. It was later determined that the fire was started by a lightning strike. It was door eight that burned out, and it, it was it was kind of like the Cadillac of our warehouses. It wasn't our prettiest warehouse. It was the biggest one, and in it, it held the pride and joy of all your finished lumber. And impressed me the most is the way the firemen kept the uh, gas pump from blowing up and that was right next to the building. I was like two feet away from the building. What was interesting about it, and it wasn't really my decision, it was more the employees, it was just a foregone conclusion that we were still going to be open that day. The firemen were going to put out the fire and we were going to just start doing business. And there wasn't really a disruption in, in service to customers to any degree. So in the middle of the firefighting, we had forklifts driving around putting together garages and cap loads and everything else. I'd say it was remarkable. I got to hand it to the operations uh, section and the, and the yard and staff. And everybody pulled together to do that. The fire and the continued building boom underscored the need for another yard and greater presence in the North Metro. So they did buy the yard in 1985 from GM Stewart Lumber Company. And uh, we had, I don't recall how many employees we had here at the time, but it was probably a $6 million a year yard at the time. And we probably had seven or eight people here, yard and office total. Um, it had come from about a million dollars not too long before that to about six and it was on its way up and I think Share Brothers saw it as an opportunity and it was. The old office we used to have under GM Stewart Lumber here and three years under Share Brothers, it was nothing but a double wide trailer on stilts and every time the wind came through you kind of wondered how far into the arsenal you were going to go. Uh, so it was, it was a place that was very male dominated, it was sloppy and ill repair and everybody liked it anyway, it was home.